So look, uh, the XRP ledger is able to settle any transaction in three seconds. So I think I should be able to explain tokenization in 60 seconds. Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And that was Marcus Infonger. And yes, tokenization, it's a big focus for Ripple. And you're also going to see that it is a big, important use case for the XRP ledger. But what I really want to do in this video is share with you why tokenization, stablecoins, and custody all fit together. And it's going to put Ripple, the company, in a position of one of the most powerful players in moving value in the world. Let's break this down. Custody. This is going to give you a quick explainer followed by Ripple's head of custody. Then a quick explainer on stablecoins, followed by David Schwartz, the CTO of Ripple, revealing the strategy of tokenized real world assets on the XRP ledger with a big surprise in his answer. And finally, PayPal's head of crypto, nicely putting all those components together, which will no doubt give you this aha moment. All right, everybody, let's go. I'm going to explain what crypto custody is and how it applies to blockchain payments. So let's get into it. Taking custody of crypto really means guarding an organization's private keys. These are digital codes that grant access to funds in your crypto wallet. If your business is holding digital like currencies like stablecoins or Bitcoin on your balance sheet, you might use a crypto exchange, a third party custody provider, or a software solution to secure your private keys. But what if you're sending and receiving payments with digital currencies? Who has custody then? Your partner should have extensive security measures in place, including multi-step verification when accessing your account or making a payment, encrypting payments data and passwords, as well as storing decryption keys offline and requesting multi-party signing to unlock those keys. Okay, now let's jump to a real quick clip with Katrine Kohler, the head of custody product at Ripple. Ripple is a leader in enterprise blockchain and crypto solutions. And I think that's also what it's mostly known for. And we are transforming how the world moves, manages, tokenizes and stores value. And since the beginning, we always focused on how enterprises can take advantage of blockchain and crypto in general. And we started off with cross-border payments. We built mm -hmm. a global cross-border payments network, which is called Ripple Payments. And yeah. that has processed millions of transactions worth, uh, worth billions of dollars. And we work with financial institutions to address the pain points with the vast cross-border payments markets, which today operates mostly very slow, expensive, and, and is very error prone. And yeah. in recent years, we've moved beyond payments to offer additional crypto native services, such as custody technology. And also we help developers, of course, build on the XRP ledger. With cryptographic keys, which are required to access and move the digital assets, um, they actually represent the assets themselves. So when we so safekeeping these assets is what we actually mean when we talk about digital asset custody. The amount of crypto assets custodied is expected to reach about 10 trillion by 2030. Or if you think about it differently, um, for example, Northern Trust and HSBC anticipated that up to 10% of all financial assets will be tokenized by 2030. Um, through the custody technology offering of Ripple, we will be able to provide those customers uh, a tech stack where they can build on to actually bring their services then to market. But when you talk about uh, sort of new areas for tokenization, uh, you know, going outside traditional financial markets, where, where, where is the next sector? Is that, is that going to be real estate or, or is there another sector you think that's most likely to be the next one? Without a crystal ball, it's a bit difficult. Um, but I well, think I what we need to look in your crystal ball. <laughs> Not sure I have it handy right now. Um, <laughs> I do think we will. Uh, what we are seeing at the moment is much more in the traditional financial space. Also thinking about um, larger companies like BlackRock, Fidelity, and Goldman Sachs uh, mm. getting into the space. It's a lot of it is driven by 
digitization and tokenization of financial products and reinventing existing value chains, um, yeah. where we do see it in the Western market at the moment. And of course, stable coins are absolutely required to enable many yeah. use cases, um, to be able to transact not only against traditional fiat rails, but to actually have the whole processing on chain. And now we'll jump to just about a one minute explainer on stable coins. Stable coins are the fastest growing digital asset. They've attracted interest and investment from the likes of Visa and PayPal. And they've been called the next frontier in cross-border payments by industry analysts. Stable coins, for example, USDC and USDT are digital currencies, but unlike others, their value is specked to a fiat currency like the US dollar. They're less than a decade old, but $11 trillion of stablecoin will settle on blockchain just in 2022. The influence of stablecoins on the global money movement is clearly growing. Today, they account for nearly 70% of transactions on the blockchain, eclipsing more established digital currencies like Bitcoin. But you may ask, how can they be used by fintechs? Firstly, stablecoins make a great high-speed rail for cross-border payments, which is why many fintechs use them as an alternative to the SWIFT banking system. For example, rather than sending money from Asia to Europe using SWIFT, you can do it on the same day and likely for lower fees by converting the Asian currency into stablecoins and those stablecoins into euros. Secondly, because they're efficient, stablecoins are now used to settle business payments. As a B2B fintech, giving your merchants access to stablecoins means they can accept and send payments in new markets where other options might be slow or expensive. And now we'll jump to that very interesting interview that just took place a couple of days ago with David Schwartz and the brand new tokenization partner called Zonix. Have a listen. I have one question for you, David. Okay. Of course. So, I mean, what is XRPL's strategy for RWAs? Just give me 30 seconds. Well, I mean, putting my like XRP ledger person hat on, the ledger strategy is to provide the technological base to allow people to build real world assets on it, yeah. to allow them to build them at low cost, to allow them to issue them and get the sort of life cycle experiences that they want and to enable companies like you. You know, obviously the XRP ledger can't take on a retail customer like directly. It can't form a business relationship. And so all it can do is provide the tools that people like you need to bring people onto it. Ripple as a company, you know, has a strategy to promote trust in XRP and the utility of the XRP ledger. And so our strategy is to find companies and to get them building and to make sure that people understand what the advantages and what the use cases are around the XRP ledger and form partnerships with companies like Xonix to make sure that for people where the technology is a good fit for the problems that they have, they don't have technical barriers. One of the biggest challenges that I think the XRP ledger as a system has is that there isn't that much developer expertise. Like if you want to build a project on top of an EVM chain, it's very easy to find developers. And so I think the big one is just to make sure that if you have a problem that the XRP ledger is a good solution to and you never find, never knew the XRP ledger even supported real world asset tokenization, then you're going to use an inferior solution and that doesn't benefit anyone. Or if you like the XRP ledger's fit, but you can't find a developer because there just aren't enough of them. So I think the strategy is to make sure that there aren't those obstacles. I agree. Thank you. I think because I just need to throw it out there. It took us like what, like nine months to build on XRP uh, Ledger natively on RWA. And then like it is difficult, not because the system is so beautifully done and it's, uh, you have to spend a lot of time to understand every component of it coming from an EVM background to shift the gears, mental gears to see how it fits. It is different. All the entire pieces. Yeah. It is different. So to your comment, that is something that I would agree. Yeah. So it took us nine months to build on the entire engine on XRP Ledger. And that's sort of the challenge building to any blockchain from zero you know, is a heavy lift. And that's why you guys are important because if everybody who wanted to launch a real world asset tokenization project had said, hey, the XRP ledger is a good fit for me. Now I got to go hire a bunch of engineers, train them and either find people who have XRP ledger experience or train them. And it's going to take nine months. And obviously that's, that's an unstarter. So we're glad you guys are here. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't need to do anymore now. So Zonix is there, yep. XRPL ledger is there. So that's oh, it. Yeah, so, so problem solved. <laughs> True. <laughs> And now I'm going to give you that aha moment with the head of crypto from PayPal, where he talks about the custody tokenized money market funds for yield and 
stable coins. These three are the future. Those 150 billion in stable coins that are out there, I think that we are in the first inning of how this is going to evolve. Maybe we are on, at the top of the first inning. So I don't think that we can, uh, we should assume that the market is settled. Uh, hopefully, we will see trillions in, in assets under management and stable coins, and the market will benefit for more entrants and from uh, strong companies that want to, to have a presence in the market. Most of that volume happens on crypto markets, and a lot of that is institutional trading. And traditionally, the way that issuers have monetized the stable coins has been through interest on the reserve. So they are fiat backed. So when somebody gets means one token, there is a counterparty in, in fiat that goes into a reserve that is invested into assets. Those assets generate a yield. That's how the issuer has traditionally made money. I think that that monetization model has been a little bit of an artifact. A, of the interest rate environment today. So if you look five years from now, I expect and I hope that interest rates will be lower. Uh, but I also think that there will be a lot of what you're seeing a, that is happening on the asset management space. We've been talking a lot about payments, but also there's a ton of activity that is happening in the asset managers with BlackRock and Franklin Templeton and Fidelity and others. So I do think that we will see a decoupling uh, between the, the yield component and the payments component. And I think that probably my vision of the future is if you are the CFO of a large corporation that is engaged in digital currencies and you have extra uh, cash, you will keep that in something that is a tokenized money market fund or similar, and you will get your yield from, from that point. And then when you want to make a payment, you will convert that tokenized money market fund into uh, tokenized money, which is what a stable coin is, and then you will send the, the stable coin. I do think that a stable coin is an imperfect instrument uh, for for yield. A uh, tokenized money market fund is an imperfect instrument for payments, and those instruments should be what they are meant to, to be. Uh, and then the stable coins will not be monetized on yield on the reserve. They will monetize on transaction fees. That's why we, we were saying, look, we, we optimize for things that are is specific for payments. We care about KYC on our network. We care about throughput. We care about scalability. And it makes sense when you put all those things together, combined with our unique assets, the, the, the capillarity into fiat rails and the consumer base and the user base, we felt compelled to launch our own because we're saying, well, we think that we have a right to play. We have an ability to serve consumers and, and merchants there. And we believe in choice.